Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Eclectic Humanist, Season 2, Episode 1. It's a new year, and it's been an eventful couple of months since our last little chat, so before getting to today's content, which I actually finished recording yesterday, I think I might like to say a few words by way of introduction and simply by way of catching up. To start, well... It's been 10 months since everything is shut down here. The world is slowly moving again, of course, but we're still in the midst of a pandemic. And yesterday, or at least yesterday as of this recording, in the United States alone, 4,200 people died of, I'm tempted to say COVID-19, but what I really intend to say is ignorance and science denial, or rather culpable ignorance and culpable science denial. And as a, as a central principle of humanism is basing one's decisions on the best available information, I do have to express my outrage and actual moral disgust at anyone who still continues to perpetuate the false notion that the public health measures being taken by responsible governments are being taken in vain. They're not. Wear a mask, social distance, and listen to what the medical experts say. It's also just a couple of days now since a mob of rioting Trumpledites attempted to overthrow the government effectively and completely undermine or destroy American democracy. I've been pleasantly surprised, genuinely surprised, that the institutions of American democracy appear to have been strong enough to withstand the assault that Trump has actually launched on it, not just Trump, but his cohorts, basically the Republican Party, over the last several years. This is encouraging. Yes, it was a horrible day, but the result is genuinely encouraging. And while I'll make no predictions, I'm in no position to do so. I'm at least optimistic that the tide of right-wing idiocy, of anti-science, anti-information, anti-truth, anti-fact agitation may have actually reached its high watermark in terms of its political power, though it'll be a long, long, long time before that particular social disease has been eradicated from the American body politic, not that it'll ever be eradicated completely. But I think going into the new year, we have genuine reason for optimism. I could be wrong, but I am hopeful. As for what I intend for this podcast going forward, and maybe as for why I fell silent toward the end of last year, I should probably say a few words about that as well. The university where I work is still teaching under lockdown. All of our teaching is being done from home. And quite frankly, the demands of recording content for my job for presentation online were such that I didn't have any time left to devote to being the eclectic humanist, if you will. If you're up till 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning regularly recording lectures and editing lectures, you don't have much time left over for what is effectively a hobby. Fortunately, this term, one of the courses that I'm teaching, it's called Human Nature and Technology, dovetails quite nicely with what I envisioned for this podcast. So a number of the talks I'll be posting over the next few months will be edited versions of lectures that I'll be giving to my students as well, changing, of course, whatever needs to be changed given the different demands of the two venues. On that note, the first few talks I'll be posting will be on Lucretius's wonderful poem on the nature of things, dating to about the first century BC, which preserves the only sympathetic ancient account of Epicurean philosophy and holds within it the seeds of much of modernity and almost all of modern secular humanism. It is, in fact, in my opinion, of all of the literary and philosophic works coming out of the ancient Western world, the one that is most important where humanism is concerned. So it's a nice way of starting the year, I think, and I hope you enjoy it. Today's talk will simply be an introductory lecture, and it'll be followed up by a series of other brief chats devoted to the individual books of the poem, of which there are six. So without further ado, I think I'm just going to get on with things. 
the pre-recorded part of the episode begins right about now. Greetings, folks, and welcome to the wonderful world of Lucretius on the nature of things and Epicurean philosophy. In this first little talk, by way of a contextualizing lecture, I'd like to lay out a brief sketch of the poem's philosophical background, and then conclude with a few notes about its rediscovery at the dawn of Western modernity. The outline is necessarily sketchy, and the observations in some cases are speculative, though I hope not unrealistically so. Summaries of the so-called pre-Socratics are drawn largely but not exclusively from Aristotle's Metaphysics, Carl Sagan's book version of his landmark science documentary series Cosmos, particularly Episode 7, The Backbone of the Night, the peer-reviewed Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and Lucretius' own text. The first folks we need to talk about are the Ionian philosophers. When we think about Greek philosophy, we tend to think with good reason about the big three, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Their lives and arguments are well attested and have played not only a formative but also a defining role in the intellectual culture of the West. This being said, the tradition that they represent is not the only Greek tradition that is of interest, nor is it the only one to have borne useful fruit. Another tradition, much less well attested, due to the tragic and near-complete loss of manuscripts, but nonetheless vital in its time, is that arising in the Greek islands and colonies along the east shore of the Aegean, collectively known as Ionia. The tradition that develops here, on the edges of the Greek world, is in some ways different from that centered on Athens, in that it develops in a much more materialist, much less idealist strain than does the more mainstream mainland tradition. This difference, of course, is not absolute, and there are some notable exceptions. But in general, the pattern's useful to hold in mind as we skim over the thought world of the problematically named pre-Socratics. Our first thinker is Thales of Miletus. His dates are about 620 to 546 BCE. Among Thales' achievements was establishing a basis for the field of geometry, which would later be taken up by Euclid. More relevant to our discussion of Lucretius, though, was his proposition that the world arose through natural processes without reference to any divine principle or maker. That is, Thales contended that all natural phenomena could be explained without reference to anything transcendent or supernatural. Of course, he didn't have all the explanations, and much of what he did offer up, such as the cosmos having arisen from the foundational element of water, an idea he seems to hold in common with much of the ancient Semitic world, including the ancestors of the Hebrews, was wrong. But the principle of naturalistic or non-dualistic understanding is vital to what follows. Our next key figure is Anaximander of Miletus, dates roughly 610 to 546 BC. Anaximander was the first person known to have adopted a formal experimental method of generating knowledge in this case using a vertical stick to determine the precise lengths of the year and the seasons through observing and meticulously recording the lengths and angles of the shadow, or in other words by inventing the sundial. He was also the first person on record to make a map of the known world, and the first person to make a globular map of the stars. And again, while some of his ideas turned out to be wildly off base, for example his notion of the sun and moon and stars as being made of fire glimpsed through holes in the revolving sphere of the heavens, with earth at its center, he did suggest, working from Thales, that it maintained its place by a balance of natural forces without any divine interference. He also proposed the earliest known theory of evolution. His reasoning runs roughly as follows. We are helpless at birth and require long periods of care before we are self-sufficient. Therefore, we must have descended from less helpless creatures who could survive on their own from an earlier age. In fact, he proposed that our ancestors were fish and at some point moved on to dry land, their descendants gradually evolving into us and other land-based creatures over many generations. Not bad for the 6th century BC. He posited as well that life originated spontaneously in the mud. Anaximander also believed in infinite worlds which were probably inhabited and were, in any case, all subject to the same natural laws as our own. There was thus for him no need to suppose any necessity for any supernatural or transcendent agency. Next on our little list of pragmatic luminaries is Theodorus of Samos, who lived sometime during the 6th century BCE. Sorry, I don't have exact dates for him. 
Though not credited with any great theoretical or cosmological insights, Theo was an inventor of no small achievement, having developed the key, the ruler, the carpenter's square, the level, the lathe, central heating, and possibly a method of bronze smelting. He's of value here mainly for his application of techne and for his embodiment of the pragmatic spirit and the empirical epistemology of the age in which he lived. As for Hippocrates of Kos, we actually have both dates and words for him. He lived from about 450 to about 380 BCE and is of course familiar from the physician's oath that bears his name. He's important largely due to his insistence that medicine be based upon the best available science. Counter to the received beliefs of his time, he maintained that all ailments have physical causes, even going so far as to suggest that the notion of a god or gods is merely a verbal placeholder for human ignorance. In his words, men think epilepsy divine merely because they do not understand it. But, if they called everything divine that they do not understand, why, there would be no end to divine things. Smart guy, that Hippocrates. Next up in our little traipse through the history of Ionian philosophy is Empedocles, who himself was not actually Ionian, he was from Sicily, but was working with ideas developed in the Eastern Aegean. His dates, by the way, were roughly 492 to 432 BCE. He was an empiricist who proved the existence of air as a substance through an experiment with a device called a water thief, basically a hollow metal ball with small holes in the bottom and a hollow tube sticking up the top. When the ball is submerged, it fills through the small holes. The thumb is then placed over the hole in the tube so that the water remains in the ball when it's lifted from the vat. When the thumb is removed from the tube, the water flows out the little holes. Only if air is an actual substance does this behavior make sense. While to us it may seem mere common sense, the materiality of air had been in question until that point. Empedocles also proposed that the speed of light was very fast, but not infinitely fast, and suggested the extinction of species through failure of physical abilities, and following an axiomander maintained that species change over time through adaptation to their environments or in other words, that they evolve through something like natural selection. He's also held to have suggested that the received gods were in fact misrepresentations or misunderstandings of impersonal and unconscious natural forces. In a way though, all the figures mentioned so far are basically a warm-up to Democritus of Abdera, an Ionian colony in northern Greece. His dates, by the way, are about 460 to 370 BCE. Democritus equated understanding with enjoyment, recognizing, recognizing that where there is no mental pleasure, there will be no learning, and that learning is in itself a type of pleasure. He maintained as well that all things could be understood, that is, there is no facet of the cosmos that is in principle inaccessible to the human intellect. The world, according to Democritus, formed spontaneously through natural forces and then decayed according to those same forces. Other worlds also form and decay by those same forces. As they are in perpetual motion, sometimes those worlds collide. Some, moreover, are inhabited while others are lifeless. Where life does arise, though, it does so spontaneously from primeval ooze, for example, in its simplest form, and then gradually evolves greater complexity. In terms of our perceptions, these are purely physical, mediated exclusively through the senses. In fact, for Democritus, mental processes also, thought, feeling, consciousness, are attributable to material forces acting on matter, not to some non-physical or supernatural essence. Democritus was also the first person in the West to articulate what we now call the atomic theory of matter. According to this theory, all matter can be reduced to minuscule particles that themselves can't be divided further. These particles and the void through which they move account for the entirety of the cosmos. Neither immortal souls nor immortal gods exist, or in his words, nothing exists but atoms and the void. He suggested as well, and is the first person at least that I know of to have done so, that the Milky Way is made of stars. Our next figure of note is Anaxagoras, who lived from about 500 to about 428 BCE. 
Anaxagoras rejected the atomic theory, but did embrace materialism. He was the first to propose that the moon shines by reflected light and to develop a naturalistic theory of the phases of the moon. By this point, though, the political climate was becoming inhospitable to philosophic materialism, so he had to circulate his theories in secret. At one point, he was brought to Athens as a guest and confidant of the great statesman Pericles, but ended up being convicted for impiety by an Athenian jury. Yes, we've heard this story before. Pericles freed him, but the age of Ionian empirical science was effectively over in Greece, though it did have a resurgence later in Alexandria and Egypt. Incidentally, he also maintained that the moon is a purely physical substance and that the sun is a glowing stone in the sky. The last figure I want to mention in the context of Ionian science, of which he was certainly an inheritor, was Aristarchus of Samos, who lived in the 3rd century BC and worked at Alexandria. He proposed the Earth-Sun system as heliocentric, with the Sun many times larger than the Earth, as opposed to the geocentric system that Aristotle proposed and that Ptolemy later expanded on. Basically, this is the Copernican model about 1800 years before Copernicus. But wait, I pretend I can hear you thinking. You've been going on for several minutes now about Ionian philosophers and you haven't even mentioned the most important one, Pythagoras. And, well, I suppose I should probably do that now. Pythagoras of Samos, whose years are roughly 570 to 495 BCE, is one of the best known Ionian thinkers and an important contributor to Western thought. His contributions to mathematics, especially geometry, are well known. Pythagoras deduced in the 6th century BCE that the world is a sphere and was the first person to use the word cosmos in reference to the universe, as opposed to chaos. The difficulty with Pythagoras from a materialist point of view is that, unlike the Ionians we've been discussing, he was an idealist. He thought that the laws of the cosmos could be deduced through pure thought, not bound to empirical observation. He thought, for instance, that mathematical reasoning was superior to reasoning through observation, believed in the existence of perfect geometric forms, real but non-physical, and also believed in the existence of a perfect human form, real but non-physical, we call that the soul. He posited the transmigration of souls, a doctrine of reincarnation that I suspect he inherited from the deep Indo-European past, as other ancient Indo-European cultures, as widely separated as India and Ireland, held similar views. He also maintained that the observable world is an imperfect reflection of the perfect non-physical world and thus subordinate to it. This teaching of the alienation of the body from the mind or the physical from the spiritual would have deep and lasting effects on subsequent Western thought, both religious and philosophic. Pythagoreans would go on to discourage free scientific inquiry in some interesting ways in favor of a rigid orthodoxy. For example, Pythagoras himself believed that all numbers could be derived from whole numbers. The discovery that the square root of two cannot be thus derived, however, proves this assumption false. Rather than publicize the discovery, which after all is profoundly important to mathematics, though my own mathematical acumen is insufficient to the task of explanation, Pythagoreans suppressed it, deeming it too dangerous for the masses, and reserved knowledge of this and subsequently other knowledge for an inner circle of the initiated. Pythagoras thus presents us with two problems, one centered on questions of the best means to knowledge, and the other centered on the question of who is allowed to know. Enter the hero of our story, or at least Lucretius's hero, Epicurus. Epicurus of Samos, dates 341 to 271 BCE, is the founder of a school of thought, Epicureanism, that exerted a considerable influence during later Greek and subsequent Roman pagan antiquity. He himself was a materialist following in the Ionian tradition. He accepted the atomic theory of matter, rejected the notion of an immaterial or immortal soul, and maintained that nothing exists but atoms moving in a void. His notion of the gods was essentially agnostic, as he saw their existence or non-existence as unknowable. But he also maintained that if they did exist, they had nothing to do with us. 
A good life, therefore, was to be lived in and focused on this world, the only world we know we have. This good life consists of tranquility and freedom from fear, which in turn arises from intellectual and sensual pleasure in moderation, control of desire, and absence of anxiety over the imaginary or irrelevant gods. That is, the best life for a human being is a life of engagement of both body and mind with the world in which we live in such a way that we neither physically nor psychologically undermine our own well-being or the well-being of others. His account of justice is contractual, arising from human relations and human nature themselves, without appeal to any transcendent authority or principle. Unfortunately, most records of Epicurus's thought have been lost. Of the three substantial accounts that survive, those by Cicero, Plutarch, and Lucretius, only Lucretius's is written from an Epicurean point of view. Cicero was a Stoic and Plutarch a Platonist, both of which schools were opposed to Epicureanism. So, the accounts that these writers give are negatively biased. De Rerum Natura, On the Nature of Things, by Lucretius, whose dates are 99-55 to BCE, is thus the only surviving extended account of Epicurean thought actually written from an Epicurean point of view. And this lone sympathetic source nearly vanished forever. Actually, from about the 4th or 5th century onward, it very much had been lost, while unbeknownst to the rest of the world, a single manuscript that had survived the bonfires to which much of the best of pagan antiquity had been consigned in the two centuries following the conversion of Emperor Constantine moldered in an isolated German monastery. And if you're interested in a detailed and very well-documented account of this often overlooked facet of Western history, Catherine Nixie's The Darkening Age, The Christian Destruction of the Classical World by Mariner Books, published 2017, provides an excellent and long overdue account of this story. And with Lucretius huddled down safely on his musty German shelf for a thousand years or so, it's time for us to skip ahead to the year 1417. The impact of the rediscovery of On the Nature of Things in this year, pretty much at the dawn of Western modernity, is a contentious matter. Some cultural historians, most notably Stephen Greenblatt, in his book The Swerve, How the World Came to be Modern, attribute much of modernity itself to this event, while many others gloss over Lucretius entirely. My own position is moderate. To attribute too much to the single book, no matter how widely translated and published it happens to be, would probably be to claim too much, and would certainly be to undervalue the many other important and well-attested classical sources that were coming back into circulation in Western Europe around this time. However, to ignore the consonance between the contents of De Rerum Natura with much of the best thought of the modern period would be correspondingly to deny too much. A brief sketch therefore follows basically an incomplete list of important figures who are known to have read and admired the work from which you should draw your own conclusions. Machiavelli, the founder of modern political philosophy, owned a copy and seems to have found in its pages a part of the basis for his rejection of the religious and philosophic teleologies of, of the late medieval world. Leonardo is also known to have owned a copy, for whatever that may be worth. I'm thinking of both his penchant for mechanistic invention and his placement of humanity at the center of his intellectual and aesthetic cosmos. Similarly, French humanist, thinker, and essayist Michel de Montaigne frequently cited Lucretius in his poetry and essays, and his personal copy of the text is rich with marginal annotations, indicating an active and fruitful engagement. Moving forward, an Italian monk and Christian humanist named Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake by the Inquisition in 1600 for both propagating Copernican astronomy and proposing a world view, many of whose specifics, such as an infinite universe, can be traced directly to Lucretius, including one of the key arguments for the universe's lack of boundaries. February 17th, by the way, is, in my world, Giordano Bruno Day, make it a thing. In fact, when Bruno was burned, he was denied the dignity of clothes, and rather than be allowed the customary privilege of uttering a few words before his death, he was silenced by a wooden vice clamped to his tongue, his ideas apparently being deemed too dangerous to risk any public exposure. 
Similarly, Galileo's propositions regarding the rates at which objects would be expected to fall in a vacuum make a brief but well-reasoned appearance in On the Nature of Things. Galileo also advocated the atomic theory of matter. Another fan was Sir Francis Bacon, first to articulate the formal scientific method that is practiced to this day. Bacon also argues for jettisoning any but a naturalistic means of generating knowledge about the natural world. Bacon's private secretary, Thomas Hobbes, founder of modern political science, was also an admirer. Those of you familiar with this thought will recognize much about desire and aversion, pain and pleasure in this poem. Another admiring reader was Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his emphasis on finding happiness in this life rather than any supposed other life does seem to resonate pretty well with Lucretius. A more concrete link might be Thomas Jefferson, one of the principal framers of the U.S. Constitution, who owned five copies, apparently it would not do to be caught without one, and declared, I am an Epicurean. I consider the genuine, not imputed, doctrines of Epicurus as containing everything rational in moral philosophy which Greece and Rome have left us. And I do think it's worth pausing on that phrase, imputed doctrines. Epicureanism has had a pretty bad rep over the last couple of millennia, and there are some really clear reasons why. And while I'd like to save a detailed discussion of the central ideas of Epicureanism for when we address the poem itself, if you go online and just Google Epicurean synonyms, here's a list that you might come up with. And this is from Lexico, just because they're at the top of my list. This is pretty much random. But synonyms for Epicurean are hedonist, sensualist, pleasure seeker, pleasure lover, sybarite, voluptuary, epicure, gourmet, gastronome, connoisseur, gourmand, glutton, bon vivant, and bon vivant. That is the way that Epicureanism registers at the level of, I'm not even going to say popular culture, I'm going to say standard English, is largely associated with self-indulgence, with shallow pleasures, with overindulgence, rather than what Epicurus and Lucretius actually propound. Or in other words, the dominant discourse of our culture, of Western culture over the last couple of thousand years, has done a complete and completely dishonest hatchet job on Epicurus while he was moldering on his shelf in Germany, unable to defend himself. Dante, for example, in the Inferno, Canto 10, places Epicurus in the sixth circle of hell. Here I will read from Sayre's translation. Thus onward still, following a hidden track between the city's ramparts, from the fires my master goes, and I go at his back. O sovereign power, that through the impious gyres, said I, dost wheel me as thou deemst well. Speak to me, satisfy my keen desires. Those that find here their fiery burial, may they be seen? For nothing seems concealed, the lids are raised and none stand sentinel. And he, all these shall be shut fast and sealed, when from Jehoshaphat they come anew, bringing their bodies now left far afield, and hereabouts lie buried close in view, Epicure and his followers, they who hold that when the body dies, the soul dies too. And therein lies the chief offense. While the claim about the Epicurean position is true, it also explains to us why the animus against Epicureanism generally particularly among culture controlled by one or another religious authority. And if you want to see how effectively offering compelling arguments for an idea that undermines not just the authority but the legitimacy of a religious institution, just take a look at how Copernicus, Galileo, and especially Giordano Bruno were treated. This conflict, broadly speaking, is, I would argue, one of the defining conflicts of the modern period. And in certain influential quarters of modern society down to this day, particularly in North America, this is a conflict that is still going on. That is, the conflict between secular humanism on the one hand, which is effectively a modern embodiment of Epicurean thought, and religious authority on the other. 
or to bring it as close to home as possible if you want to take it to current events, and I mean things unfolding around us in public discourse as I speak, Lucretius is relevant to the culture wars. On a more explicitly scientific plane, both Charles Darwin and Albert Einstein were also readers of Lucretius, in whom we find both a theory of evolution, though not the same theory, and certainly without the wealth of data that Darwin and subsequent evolutionary biologists would put forward, and an account of a universe without a fixed absolute reference point, one of the cornerstones of relativity. This picture is necessarily incomplete, but it should be enough to either tantalize or provoke. In either case, it probably has your attention, so you're now ready to dive into On the Nature of Things, one of the great epics of classical antiquity in which the hero is, on the one hand, Epicurus, and on the other hand, not an individual person at all, but rather the human intellect itself, and incidentally, also a poem composed with the explicit intent to offer comfort and consolation in the face of our inevitable demise. Happy reading! And thank you for listening. If you'd like to be in touch for comments or questions, you can, of course, find me at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com if email is your thing. Or, of course, I am also at EC Humanist on Twitter and Eclectic Humanist on Facebook. I hope you've enjoyed this little talk. Until next time, of course, as always, be kind to each other. Mm -hmm.